morning. Philippians chapter number 4. Great chapter of the Bible. A whole lot we could teach on this morning. I mean, verse number 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, of good report, think on these things. If there be anything of virtue, anything of praise. All right, I'm going to talk about when you get down, what's going to start helping you? Verse number 8. All right, we get into Philippians 4.13. Everybody knows that one. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, but, I'm a little hot, Brother Randy. I can hear echo on me. That's always that way. It's always that way. But, you know, verse number 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But, we don't have any time to talk about all that today. Verse number 12 is where we're going to start. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, a we'll, little bit of context for you. Church at Philippi, okay, keep in mind, this is the church that started out of that Philippian jailer's home. When Paul and Silas were in prison, and you know, they'd been beaten about all day, they'd been thrown in the inner part of the prisons, open sores and open wounds. Most likely they were chained hand and feet to the wall, which meant that their backs were in the muck and the mire of that prison where they had just been whipped with a cat of nine tails. Not an enjoyable place to be, but yet they started singing praise after they'd prayed at midnight, and then God sent an earthquake, opened up all the jail cells. Philippian jailer ends up getting saved. Then he takes Paul and Silas back to his own house to care for them, to treat their wounds, and then his whole house got saved, it said. And then, after that point, they never broke fellowship spiritually with the Apostle Paul. They couldn't always be there in person, but they always were inquiring after him. I mean, in fact, you can look down in uh, verse number 18. It says that I have received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, to sacri a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. They were always inquiring, Hey, preacher, do you need anything? Hey, preacher, you're a little bit hungry. You, can we send you some food? Do you need some money? Do you need a new pair of shoes? Do you need some clothing? Because we can go back up to, you know, the beginning of the chapter, and you'll find that at the beginning, no, no one entreated him. No church, not even the other apostles. They didn't believe him at first. They said, "Isn't this Saul of Tarsus, the one that's been persecuting us?" We took Barnabas over in chapter number eleven of the book of Acts. Go down to. See Saul that he came and spoke on it. He said, boys, I think something happened to this fellow. What do you think happened? I think he met Jesus. Why do you say that? Because he's talking like we talk. You know, he walks like we walk. But not everybody was always on the Apostle Paul's side. In fact, we heard one night during revival this week that at one point, not revival, camp meeting, whatever you want to call it, but we heard about it one night this week that at a certain point, all men had forsaken the Apostle Paul. It says Luke was still with him. But then he's inquiring that to t Timothy, you know, send the parchments. He's getting ready to walk off, leave the scene. He wants to make sure that the letters that he's written to the churches, that they get, you know, every I dotted, every T crossed, and he's going to send them to those churches in Minor Asia. But that was the beginning. Nobody was with him. In the latter part, nobody was with him in person. But we find that the church at Philippi, they always cared about the preacher that came by their way one day. They never got over the one that started the work in that house that instructed them. We don't know how long the Apostle Paul was in Philippi after he was thrown in prison. Probably still had to stay in trial. Yeah, if not, certainly after this fellow and his house got saved, they stuck around a while to 
teach them the things of God, to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We know that even when the Apostle Paul, by necessity, was led of the Holy Ghost to go to a different town, start a new church, or to go and witness to somebody in a different town, he'd always send one of those preachers that he had trained up in the faith to them at some point to encourage them, to reaffirm the things which the Apostle Paul had spoken of. And what do you think the epistles were for? They were one more time the Apostle Paul had a message to preach to him. Just because of those chains, because he was in bonds, he couldn't get there in person. So the Holy Ghost inspired him to write it down. It's one more time to reaffirm, to you know, re-educate. Give them something that would help them carry on to the extra mile. Just go another mile. Just one more step. And as a result, the Apostle Paul realized if you just go one step at a time, you put one foot in front of the other, you'll be able to say as he did, that he fought a good fight. He finished his course. How do you do that? One step at a time. You can't. I had forgotten about it, but this week YouTube recommended me a video. I'm talking about the, some of the biggest cheaters in live events. Where certainly you think, well, if you're going to cheat, you don't want to do it in front of all the cameras. But it was that one chick that would just like hop in a car and skip half of a marathon and then finish. And everybody's like, she doesn't look too sweaty. She must be in real good shape. No, it's because she cheated. And they caught her because they went back and looked at the trail cams that they had set up, and they're like, she never came by this camera, but she went by the one after that. She took a shortcut. Now, there are no shortcuts to finish your course. It's one step at a time. But the Apostle Paul, certainly he's talking about physical things in this chapter. He says, and you know, he said he received those things of Epaphroditus that they had sent. He says... At the beginning of verse 18, I have all and abound. What's he saying? All of my needs are met. Jesus is taking care of me. Okay, verse number 12, I both know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am struck to both be full and to be hungry. Okay, then you go back up a little bit before that. You'll find that at some points he missed a meal. But God always made sure that he didn't go hungry. Sometimes he's in the fellowship of the saints. They treated him like a king, like you'd heard some of the preachers around here say that they felt like, you know, they just treated well above their station. Why does that happen? Because God's that way to everybody, and God's people are that way to God's people. The world would know that we were his disciples because of that love that we were supposed to have one for another to show it forth. God's people just treat God's people like they're God's people. But he's saying, some days I felt unworthy because I'd been given so much. But in all things. He didn't say sometimes. Didn't say when he remembered it. He's saying, in all things, verse number 12, I am instructed. Now this is the Apostle Paul. He's the one that's usually given the instruction from God to the churches. Well, who instructed him? God. What did God instruct the Apostle Paul? And I shall remind you, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. What did he instruct him? He said, in all things, he was instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, certainly, we've said that could apply to physical things. But those that read this verse and all they get out of it is, well, godliness with contentment is great gain. They're missing the other half of it. He's not just talking about the physical. He's talking about the spiritual. He's saying that, you know, he's recounting. There have been bad days, there's been good days, but how did he get through those bad days? How did he, you know, worship God on the good days and the bad days? Because deep down inside he was full. He never let the outside impact the spiritual. But at the same time, he understood that full, God had instructed him, you're supposed to be full, but you're also supposed to be hungry. I've heard people misquote this verse and say that they know how to be full and empty. It's not what God instructed him. God never instructs us to be spiritually empty. He instructs us to be spiritually full. 
but he says full and hungry what's that mean God's been too good for me to say I'm anything but full today right that I'm not pressed down shaking and bubbling over but I also understand that today is the day that the Lord hath made I also understand without his touch I could woke up this morning got out of bed brushed my teeth fixed my hair or had a bad hair day because it took me a little bit extra day I had to almost super glue that sucker down what are you saying it's all because of his grace knowing that I can't do anything on my own just because I'm full spiritually doesn't mean that I don't hunger after God's touch God's direction God's communion fellowship with him just because he's been good to me doesn't give me an excuse not to still be hungry for the things of God Hang on, we'll, we'll get to that in a second I'm not going not to spoil that one yet but he says both to be full and hungry before that he says I know he says no what does that mean he learned it he had gone through it through wisdom now he can say I do know both what's both two things how to be abased and I know how to abound what's that mean he's saying God had trained him he had learned through the instruction of God that on the days where he was supposed to be abased what's that humble he says I know how little I am he says I know how much you know he's called himself chief, chiefest of sinners he said if he remembered the things that he had done if he dwelled on the things that he had done before he got saved that it had drove him insane because of the guilt that he harbored over persecuting the very God that now he realized was right all along there's anybody that you know at one point he was in Hebrew of the Hebrews he writes what does that mean he's the best of the best he's on an ivory pedestal he may not put himself there but somebody put him on an ivory pedestal as an example of what a Pharisee should be and then God knocked him off the ivory pedestal and nobody ever had to go tell the Apostle Paul how no good dirty rotten he was he knew it he says I know how to be abased he says you want to start talking about who's unworthy he's saying I'm the most unworthy what's that mean knowing how to be abased means that you know how to keep your pride from being a problem knowing how to be abased ensures that you receive instruction rather than bucking or resisting at the word of God abased understands that I may be wrong but I still need to figure out the truth some people know they're wrong but they don't want to hear how to fix it they can't get over the fact that they did something wrong and they feel so bad about doing something wrong they're not interested in getting it made right but being abased knows I'm going to get things wrong all the time I'm human right? I'm in the sin cursed flesh I've got bad days there are days that I don't rule and reign over my emotions like I should that there are days that I instead of wondering how the Lord would have me handle it to be an example for him I just want to run away from it I want to pull a Jonah and say Lord I don't want to be in this situation I'm, I'm jumping ship we're going to Tarshish or in my case we're getting in the car and going to Skyline <laughs> right, we'll be back in a minute but I just need a break what he's like, being a base is I know that this may be hard I know it may be uncomfortable but there's a reason that God allowed it to happen being abased is Lord show me even if I did mess it up Lord show me what I did wrong so that I won't do it wrong next time being abased leads to repentance if you've got any glimmer of well I was right you won't repent and without repentance you can't turn from whatever God is unsatisfied with in your life if you're not abased then God can't do much with you in the faith. Well, you may know the Bible. You may be instructed in the doctrines of the Bible. Right? You may have been a member for a long time. You may have once been on fire for the Lord, 
But unless you can know how to be abased, God can't use you now. Just because he did once doesn't mean that you're entitled for him to do it again. Just because it could happen doesn't mean that he will. That's the project. That's one problem. We think that because God can do something that he should do it. No, God's God. He does what he wills. It's our job to make sure that our will is in line with his will. Being a base, that's not a problem. I know that all of my, you know, the thoughts that come from my heart, they're deceitfully wicked. Can't even know my own heart. My tongue's set on fire of hell, James tells us. Right? Everything about me is cursed. Of course I'd want it to be done his way. Why would I have a problem with his way? His ways are above our ways. But we don't think that way when we're not abased. We think that, well, it should have come out this way because it would have been more convenient. Well, if it was more convenient, maybe God couldn't have shown out in that situation. God chooses base things to confound the wise. Base things are generally not convenient. Base means that it's labor intensive it's simple anybody can do it but it usually requires a lot of work but anybody can dig a ditch but it doesn't mean that everybody enjoys doing it and I, mean, I don't care how bad he shape you you may not be able to pick up a shovel we can give you a spade you can help dig a trench but may not like it but anybody can do it but God can use base things that well, there's nothing special in that. Anybody could do that. Yeah, but see, I did this and God did that. That's how he uses the base to confound the wise. But we have to be abased. But then he also says, in all things I know how to be abased and to abound. What's that mean? Well, he's saying, in the flesh, I've learned how to be abased. I've learned that the flesh doesn't need any more encouragement, any more strength, any window of opportunity that it can rear up so I'm trying to stay real humble so that God can use me a whole lot but when it comes to abounding he says I also know how good the grace of God is I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good I have no sad tale to tell with the way that God has dealt with me man's a different story but he's saying I know how to abound I know how to make the best of every situation because I know in the middle of all of my situations, God's there orchestrating the whole thing. He says, it may not be enjoyable to the flesh, but I know God's up to something and that gets me excited. He says, I know how to abound, or in other words, show out to other people that even though it may be bad, even though it may be good, even though it may be the way that I wanted it to turn out, or God did something that caught me off guard just as much as everybody else, I know how to abound in the fullness of God's grace. I know how to live in it, and I know how to excel, to show out, to give God the glory that he truly deserves. Go and study what the Apostle Paul preached and thought. You know what all of it was? Essentially, if you boil it down, he's holy, we're not. You can't be holy, but He can make you holy. Everything that God wanted for you, He's already paid for it. It's been planned out. He's got all the mechanisms in line. All you have to do is yield to it. He says, if you want proof that He can, look at who I used to be. And even though I'm not perfect, look at what He's worked and done in my life. He's saying the proof is in the fact that the one that used to persecute the church is now planting churches. The one who used to ridicule saints, now he encourages them. The one that used to have warrants for people, now he's telling people how they can be set free through salvation. He's saying, I couldn't have done that for myself. God did it for me, but if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. But here, he's writing to the church of Philippi. They were very concerned about him all the time. Always wanted to know how the apostle was doing. They hated the fact that he was persecuted the way that he was. Especially, he was persecuted in their own town. They may have been ones that had persecuted him before. What if some of the members of that church were the people that beat him on that day before they threw him in jail? 
But they got a hold of God so good, and God got a hold of them so good that they cared about the one that started their church. They cared about the man of God so much that if, as long as they could help it, if they could meet a need, they were going to provide it for them. But he turns around and tells them, thank you. Right? And he says that after this. He says, Epaphroditus delivered the package. I appreciate it. It was an honorable and worthy offering unto God because he realized that they weren't given to him they were given because they loved God he said it was a wonderful offering but before he ever gets to that he says I've been instructed he didn't say that he had determined to be or that it's my conviction no he was instructed well, we know that God's no respecter of persons. We know that God's commandments are universal. And we know that if we love Him, we'll keep His commandments. So if we're instructed, if He was instructed, we're instructed. If it wasn't for everybody, why would He have told the Philippians about it? Why wouldn't He have kept it to Himself if it was a personal conviction? If it wasn't for them... Why would he waste the ink and the parchment? Right? And he says, I know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. See, Christians, we're pretty good at that hungry part. I'm not talking about food. Everybody's good at hunger. We crave things. We desire things. We have the desires of our heart. We have the desires of the Spirit. Right? I dare say that the majority of a Christian struggle is which hunger do I feed? Do I feed the old man? Do I feed the new man? Right? Do I go out and do the thing that my flesh wants to or do I do what I know God wants me to do he says never lose that hunger for the things of God but then at the same time he says I've been instructed to be full because your fullness will impact which hunger you feed think about with me here for a second but Peter if you've got three quarters of a tank of gas, you're not looking at gas stations when you go by. But unless the little orange thing comes on, most people forget that their car runs on gas. Right? But when that comes on and you're driving down the road and there's no gas station, and five minutes later there's still no gas station, and the little electronic reader, which is never right, says zero, until empty, you start panicking. Right? You would put gas in the car if a farmer came out in a rusty old gas can and said, I think there's some in here from about 1982. Well, if it gets me to the next gas stop, I'll take it. How much you want for it? I don't even care if all the rust flakes get into my gas tank and cause a big problem. I just need to make it to a gas station. You're not too selective when you empty. You'll accept anything. Right? Well, let's carry that over to the spiritual realm. We know how to be hungry. But I dare say that everybody in here at one point in their life has craved the things of God. Spiritually, if you've been saved. Craved them. Couldn't get enough of them. Right? You could stuff yourself with the Word all day long, wake up the next day and do it even more. Right, you could come to a camp meeting, God's touch be on it, and even though you've only had about eight hours of sleep the whole week, because church keeps letting out late, and then you got to wake up and go work early in the morning. Right, you've got to run kids around, you've got errands to do, there's things that you got to take care of. You don't sleep all week, but yet you feel refreshed at the end of it. Because all week long you were giving up so that you could have more of the presence of God. And God honored it. But then I dare say we also know what it is that when we walk in here, the last thing we want to do is sit down and listen to somebody spit, holler, and scream for an hour and a half. 
Right? We've got a migraine, or we've got this. We've got we've had a hard week. It may just be emotionally drained. But even though we're empty, we don't have a hunger for the things of God. We know that we have need of something. But see, that's the first problem. Nowhere do you find that we're supposed to be empty. Ever. Spiritually. In fact, I can take you over to the book of Acts. I believe one's in chapter 6, one's in chapter 7, and the other one's in chapter 11. You'll find it three times, one talking about a group of men, one talking about Stephen, and then one talking about Barnabas. You'll find the phrase that they were men full of the Holy Ghost. What's that mean? They were full. They weren't empty. They had not only embraced their spirituality, they had emptied themselves of self or asked God to empty themselves of themselves and then fill it with himself. But see, if we were supposed to be full all the time, why would we still need to be hungry? The reason we're supposed to be full is that when we go out, we can give to others. If I'm full, I have extra. I'll be honest with you. Get back to gas. I checked when I pulled in. I've only used an eighth of a tank of gas since the last time I filled up. If somebody needed gas, I wouldn't siphon it out of there. I don't want to swallow gasoline, but I'd let them do it. If you want it that bad, you can get it. Why? Because I don't need as much as I currently have. Right? How much God do we really try to bottle up that isn't meant for us? You'll find you'll be abounding. You'll be full a whole lot more when you say, Lord, fill me up so that I can pour you out to others. Right? We're supposed to be full. But see, when it comes to full, it's talking about me. He's always got more. Did he not say that if any man drink of the water that he gave him, It'd be a well springing up inside him. What's that mean? Never running out. How can I really be full if I'm supposed to be bubbling over? If the well inside of me that springs up into everlasting life, as long as that's flowing, I'm always full. Because there's more of him than I can contain. Well, what am I supposed to do with that extra? Go give it. Why? Because I always know where I can come back and get filled up again. That's why we're supposed to be hungry. So that we get down to where we've got what we need to get through the rest of the day. God says, that's enough for you. Then by the time we get back home, I get in here, next thing I know, I start filling up again. Before I head out to face the day again, I'm just full of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. Why? Because anything I've done? No. Because I just keep hanging around him and he just keeps topping me off. In fact, if we're honest, he just keeps pouring until it's in the saucer and then it's soaked up in the tablecloth and then it's pouring off onto the floor. Why? Because that's just how he is. Our God is a consuming fire. He'll fill you up if you just come to him. Whatever in you that's got you stopped up or it's keeping you from being filled all the way up, he'll, he'll remove it. He's real good at getting rid of them things. And he doesn't just remove them, he replaces them with himself. We don't need to worry about why we can't be full. What we've done to keep ourselves from being full, all we got to do is know where to go to be full. But see, it's the hungry part that keeps us returning and returning some Christians forget that they're supposed to be as the Lord was broken bread and poured out wine for others why do you think I mean one it was in remembrance the communion of what he did of himself to provide salvation they broke his body and he poured out his life's blood but he told us to take up our cross and follow after him what's that mean I must be willing to be broken and poured out if that's what's necessary for someone to hear what it is or to see or to experience the goodness of God. Lord, empty me out. Why? Because he's the one that filled me up. 
Man, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so if he pours me out, he can fill me right back up again. He gave me the means that I can always be full and always have more to pour out. The problem is that people forget that they're supposed to be poured out. Truly, how can you... Don't mistake what I'm saying. The Bible says godliness with contentment is a great gain. Contentment is talking about that spiritual, I mean the physical hunger. Right? I don't need that. Why? Because God gave me this, and this is fine. I love this. God himself gave it to me. Could have given it to anybody, but no, he gave it to me. I am content in this thing. <coughs> hunger refers to satisfaction or complacency, one or the other. If you're hungry, doesn't mean you didn't enjoy what you just had. Okay? Not going to lie. There's a lot of things that I like that taste good that I can eat, but it's not going to fill me up. For instance, okay, if I eat one Pop-Tart out of a Pop-Tart pack, it's good, but I'm not full. I'm going back into that pack for the second Pop-Tart. And if I'm being honest, after I eat the second Pop-Tart, I'm going to the drawer to get a little Debbie out. <laughs> Why? Because I'm still hungry. But just because I went for the little Debbie didn't mean that I didn't enjoy and didn't appreciate and wasn't satisfied with the Pop-Tart. It's just that I was still hungry. Right? Certainly all things of God satisfy. But see, today's the day that the Lord... What satisfied me yesterday may not satisfy me today. Why? Because today's a new day. Today's got new problems. The Lord wants me to exercise more faith. And how do I exercise more faith? By asking Him to meet a need that maybe He hadn't met before so that I can find out He satisfies that need as well. If we're hungry, it doesn't matter what comes our way, Lord, I know You can meet it. But early will I seek Thee, the psalmist said. Why? Lord, fill me up with what I need for today. I poured out a lot yesterday. I'm still satisfied. Right? I'm still abounding, and I'm still a base because I know I can't fill myself up. But Lord, I know you can, and by faith I'm asking you to fill me up so that I can go out so that I can be poured out for your honor and your glory. But if we don't stay hungry, we never get filled back up again. Right? If I had to give a lesson, or a title of a lesson, Aren't you tired of running on fumes? So many people come back in Wednesday. Why? Just to get enough gas to make it back for Sunday. They want to be filled up just enough so that they can go out and then make it right back just in the nick of time. One, that's stressful. You ever driven when the little electric one says zero and then the line just keeps getting further and further below E and then you're wondering, well, how in the world? And then all of a sudden you make it at a gas station? Right? It's a good thing that doesn't happen to some people around here. Guys would lose the rest of the hair that they do have. Right? It's stressful. They'd be pulling it out. If you're hungry, never let it get that low. There's a danger zone. What's the Apostle Paul say? He says, I'm always full. It's almost like he's at cruise of oil that the old widow woman had after she had made the meal for the prophet and then throughout that entire famine she never ran out of meal never ran out of oil but it's almost like the apostle Paul saying that's how I am God may break me and pour me out but as soon as he turns me up right again he fills me right back up the world says well surely we just beat everything out of him that was passionate and compassionate about God what do you find well, by the time he's back down there in the jail, he's singing again. They're praying again. Right? Maybe your flesh will certainly, after that day, we're going to get to have some fun tonight because they, they've lost all faith and trust in you, but you get tipped up. Lord, help me. Pick me back up. He picks you back up. The next thing you know, you start filling up from the bottom to the top. Why? Because your fullness is not external as a Christian. Your fullness comes from the internal. I was thinking this week, 
You know that Jesus' name has you and me in it? Literally, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. We're in it. Right? Us. Who's that? Us. That he wasn't God around us or God near us or God next to us or God that we can see. No, he said with us. What's that mean? A part of. He's right here. Through the person of the Holy Spirit. But then also in his name, U.S., us, we're there. You know what the J-E stands for? Jehovah, God. It was an abbreviation for it in Hebrew because they feared God so much they didn't even want to write his full name. But literally, Jesus, Jake, God, us, we're there. What you say? That's how much he desired, desired to be your fullness. He said, you know. You can look around and figure out there's nothing out there that's going to fill you up. There are things that might satisfy a craving. There are things that might make you forget how empty you really are. Let's be honest. I can eat Chinese food whenever I want to. 20 minutes later, I'm going to be hungry. Doesn't satisfy. Right? Or I've got to eat so much Chinese food that I'm miserable for the rest of the day because I feel like one of them sumo wrestlers I got all this stuff sloshing around inside my stomach. Well, he said, anything that you need that much of to satisfy you, probably not a good deal. But what? We'll stuff ourselves with the world till we're miserable, just to make that hungry feeling go away. Because we're either hungering for the spirit or the flesh is hungering. And if we're not satisfying the spirit, the spirit's not strong enough to keep the flesh in line. If we allow ourselves to be emptied, Everything that God puts in us, it's either going to be stopped up, that fountain, bringing forth unto everlasting life. How do you stop a well up? Dirt. The flesh. We're made from dirt. We let the dirt start filling into the well, what happens? Well, little by little, the well stops filling up as much. Nothing wrong with the well. Jesus is still Jesus. What's wrong? I've gotten in way between the well and the cup that he told me to have full at all times. We've blocked it. You know who's real good at breaking up blockages? The Lord. You know who's real good at restoring things to their original state? The Lord. They can take care of it. But also, the flesh, because if the flesh could completely stop God in your life, Right, If the old man wasn't weaker than the new man, because he said greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Right, If the flesh was capable of stopping what God wanted to do, he wouldn't be God. Okay, But the flesh is very good. That right? flesh can't silence the Holy Ghost. It, it can distract you, but it can't silence it. Right? There's always something. Don't care how far away you are in a foreign land prodigal son still had the moment of clarity why? because the father was still in the son son couldn't get over the way that the father had been good to him in the past you can't really block off that well of everlasting life completely there's always something seeping through every now and then a geyser is going to go off you're going to feel miserable and you know you may come to church and but what so sorry for what but unless you repent it's just going to get sealed up again unless you get the problem taken care of it's just going to happen again and then it'll be blocked off enough that you can forget about how you're not living the life that God wants you to live and that little bit that does seep through you know it's real good at sucking that dry cares of the world pride of life selfishness bitterness where do you think that root of bitterness runs off of? Doesn't live off of us. There's nothing in me to provide life. What do you think it's doing? It's choking off our spirituality and living off of that. That's why the root of bitterness will kill your spirit because it's sucking it all out of you. There's none for you to use because it's all being sucked up. Used and abused. What happens? The roots of the world get into you. They're going to suck every bit of life out of you. 
And all you'll be is hungry and you'll never be full. We're pretty good at the craving part. We're pretty good at driving by a restaurant and saying, oh, I haven't had one of them in forever. And even though we just ate, we're going to pull in there and get whatever dessert they have. We're pretty good at, well, I just had that yesterday, but it still sounds good. It's coming from, I eat Skyline like three times a week for lunch. I never get over Skyline. Why? Because it's good. I get something different every time. It's not like I get the exact same thing. Let me change it up a little bit. What do we say? We're good at the hunt. We're not good at the remaining full part. Why? Because that relies on me getting real small. And I'm good at being real loud, being a pain in other people's butts. I'm really good at allowing right the flesh to think. Well, we might be able to do that. Sounds like a good plan. But blessing and cursing and everything. That what I'm really bad at is, Lord, I'm satisfied with what you're doing right now. Whatever you bring by my way, pour me out. But I'm going to keep walking for you. Doesn't matter what I think. Yeah, it's a great idea. But unless the Lord wants to pour me out over there, I'm going to keep going where he wants me to go. But being abased is, my opinion doesn't matter. Why? Because <laughs> it's a human opinion, fleshly opinion. Even the most spiritual ideas we have are always tinged with the flesh because it came from a fleshly person. You know the plans that always work? The one that if we just step back, it's going to blow our mind. The one that doesn't have anything to do with man has everything to do with God. Right? We've figured out how to throw meetings and we've figured out how to you know, shake somebody's hand, make them feel special so that they think that we're real nice. we figured out how to stretch ourselves every which way to make everything that we want to happen in our lives happen but it leaves us empty at the end of the day. Why? Because we don't take enough time to say, Lord, fill me back up. Because as much as I've got to do out there, I hunger for you more than anything. And maybe all the things we're doing are because the Lord's put it in your life to do all those things. It is the will of God for you to do it. But how many things do we do that just end up sucking away time that we could be filled with Him and those Roots of the world start seeping into our well, sucking it dry. How much does it really take to fill us up? Truth is, not much at all. It just takes Him. Really. If you had nothing, as long as you had Him, you're full. That's what the Apostle Paul saying doesn't matter what clothes I'm wearing doesn't matter how much food I have in the cabinet doesn't matter what's going on in my life as long as I've got him I'm full that's what the point of the chapter is I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me why? because as long as i got him he can overcome anything in my life right? he's telling them I've learned to be a base because when I'm small he gets real big and the bigger he gets I'm just as full but it's almost like it's just the cherry on top of being full just when I think I can't be any more full, he shows me that I can be more full. Just when I think that, you know, Lord, you've just about satisfied all the hunger that I have for you. He does something great that causes another craving in my life. You know, deep down in my spirit, I want to get to know that God more. Why? Because I can never figure him out. How do you keep your hunger going for the things of God? Just stand back and see what God can do. Get out the way. Watch him do something. And then when he does it, you're going to say, wow, wonder what else he can do. What's that do? Lights that hunger. Stokes the fire. And as long as you're hungry for the things of God more than you're hungry for the things of the world, according to your Bible, you'll feed the one that you love the most. And if you're more hungry for God, we're all hungry for the world. We were of the world. We used to be a part of the world. We were conceived in the world. We were born into the world. We acted as part of the world by choice. And then one day, Jesus said, I'll make you into something new. That day, we chose Him over the world. 
That's what repentance was. But each day, I still have to choose Him over the world. If I hunger for something out there more than Him, I'm not going to give it a second thought. What happens? I may have been full, but I'm quickly running to empty. So many Christians become accustomed just running on fumes all the time. Aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of the stress? Aren't you tired of looking at the needle thinking, well, did I pray enough today to get there? We don't pray enough as is on our best day. I guarantee if you've been running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you haven't been praying the way that God wants you to pray. Why? Because he says pray without ceasing. It's back there on the other side of that wall in the hallway. Have you prayed? Has your life been the instrument of communication with God that there's been nothing come between you and God all day? Because that's what he wants. Why? Because that's what Christ He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Jesus never stops talking to the Father. That's what the Father expects of us. You say, well, that's not possible. Maybe in the flesh, but that's what we ought to desire to be. I'm not fooled unless I talk to God as much as God wants me to talk to Him. I guarantee you if I'm empty, I'm not going to be talking to Him. Why? Because the next thing that gives me any hope Next little podunk backwater gas station I come across, even if the gasoline looks like it's mud, if they say it'll make the car run, I'll put it in there. Even if it's some hillbilly without any teeth that claims it's moonshine, car, I've seen Mythbusters. Cars can run on moonshine. But they proved it. What are you saying? Is that good for the engine? No. But if it's all I've got, or if I think that it's my only option, I'll throw it right in the gas tank. I'll crank it up and whatever it does to the car, whatever I, I needed it. It's the only thing that I had. But if you was full, you wouldn't have even batter an eye at it. You'd have looked at it and said, who in the world would do that? You on a different day. You on the day that you decided you knew better than God. What are you saying? We've got the hunger down. We're real bad at being full. But if we want to turn the world upside down, what we need is more people that are full, but that remain hungry so that they never really get filled up. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.